Hello, welcome back to Talking Truth Ministries, where my goal is to share the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to the best of my ability, hoping that I can direct and help somebody find the most authentic example of truth, Jesus Christ, who said in his scripture, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the truth except for through me, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, we live in a world of so many deceptions um, that people don't even know what to believe anymore. And um, and I don't claim to have all the answers, but I have found a lot of information I think is pretty interesting. And since tonight is Flat Friday, I'm going to share 200 proofs the Earth is not a spinning globe. And I believe it was Eric Dubé who put this out. Um, I found it online. But it's pretty interesting. So just listen. 200 proofs the Earth is not a spinning globe. <laughs> Number one, the horizon always appear, always appears perfectly flat, 360 degrees around the observer, regardless of altitude. All amateur balloon, rocket, plane, and drone footage show a completely flat horizon over 20-plus miles high. Only NASA and other government sp space agencies show curvature in their fake CGI photos and videos. And uh, I'm going to do a separate show on the fake moon landing and some of the fake NASA stuff. <clears throat> Number two, the horizon always rises to the eye level of the observer as altitude is gained. So you never have to look down to see it. If Earth were in fact a globe, no matter how large, as you ascended the horizon, as you ascended, the horizon would stay fixed and the observer camera would have to tilt looking down further and further to see it. Number three, the natural physics of water is to find and maintain its level. If Earth were a giant sphere tilted, wobbling, and hurtling through infinite space, then truly flat, consistently level surfaces would not exist here. But since Earth is in fact an extended flat plane, this fundamental physical property of fluids finding and remaining level is consistent with experience and common sense. Number four, rivers run down to sea level, finding the easiest course, north, south, east, and west, and all other intermediary directions over the Earth at the same time. If Earth were truly a spinning ball, then many of these rivers would be impossibly flowing uphill. For example, the Mississippi in its 3,000 miles would have to ascend 11 miles before reaching the Gulf of Mexico. Number five, one portion of the Nile River flows for a thousand miles with a fall of only one foot. Parts of the West African Congo, according to the supposed inclination and movement of the ball earth, would be sometimes running uphill and sometimes running down. This would be also be the case for the Panama, Paraguay, and other long rivers. Number six. <clears throat> Number six. If Earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, as NASA and modern astronomy claim, Spherical trigonometry dictates the surface of all standing water must curve downward an easily measurable eight miles, eight inches per mile multiplied by the square of the distance. This means along a six mile channel of standing water, the earth would dip six feet on either end from the central peak. Every time such experiments have been conducted, however, Standing water has proven to be perfectly level. Surveyors, engineers, and architects are never required to factor the supposed curvature of the earth into their projects. Canals, ra railways, bridges, and tunnels, for example, are always cut and laid horizontally, often over hundreds of miles without any curvature or allowance for curvature. Number eight, the Suez Canal connecting the Mediterranean with the Red Sea is 100 miles long without any locks making the water an uninterrupted continuation of the two seas. 
When constructed, the Earth's supposed curvature was not taken into account. It was dug along a horizontal datum line 26 feet below sea level, passing through several lakes from one sea to the other, with the datum line and water surface running perfectly parallel over the 100 miles. Number nine, engineer W. Winkler was published in the Earth Review regarding the Earth's supposed curvature stating, as an engineer of many years standing, I saw that this absurd allowance is only permitted in school books. No engineer would dream of allowing anything of the kind. I have projected many miles of railways and many more of canals, and the allowance has not even been thought of, much less allowed for. This allowance for curvature means this, that it is eight inches for the first mile of a canal and increasing at the ratio by the square of the distance in miles, thus a small navigable canal for boats, say 30 miles long, will have by the above rule an allowance for a curvature of 600 feet. Think of that and then please credit engineers as not being quite such fools. Nothing of the sort is allowed. We th no more think of allowing 600 feet for a line of 30 miles of railway or canal than of wasting our time trying to square the circle. The London and North, number 10, the London and Northwest Railway forms a straight line 180 miles between London and Liverpool. The railroad's highest point, midway at Birmingham Station, is only 240 feet above sea level. If the world were actually a globe, however, curving 8 inches per mile square, the 180-mile stretch of rail would form an arc with the center point at Birmingham raising over a mile, a full 5,400 feet above London and Liverpool. Number 11, a surveyor and engineer of 30 years published in the Birmingham Weekly Mercury stated, I am thoroughly acquainted with the theory and practice of civil engineering. However bigoted some of our professors may be in the theory of surveying according to the prescribed rules, yet it is well known amongst us that such theoretical measurements are incapable of any practical illustration. All our locomotives are designed to run on what may be regarded as two true levels or flats. There are, of course, partial inclines or gradients here and there, but they are always accurately defined and must be carefully traversed. But anything approaching to eight miles in the eight inches in the mile, increasing as the square of the distance, could not be worked by any engine that was ever yet constructed, taking one station with another all over England. In Scotland, it may be stated that all the platforms are on the same relative level. The distance between eastern and western coasts of England may be set down as 300 miles. If the prescribed curvature was indeed as represented, the central stations at Rugby or Warwick ought to be close upon three miles higher than a cord drawn from the two extremities. If such was the case, there is not a driver or stoker within the kingdom that we found to take charge of the train. We can only laugh at those of you readers who seriously give us credit for such venturesome exploits as running trains around spherical curves. Horizontal, horizontal, curves, are horizontal curves on levels are dangerous enough. Vertical curves would be a thousand times worse. And with our rolling stock constructed as it at present physically impossible. <laughs> Number 12, the Manchester, <clears throat> excuse me, the Manchester Ship Canal Company, published in the Earth Review, stated it is customary in railway and canal constructions. For all levels to be referred to a datum which is nominally horizontal and is shown on all sections. It is so shown on all sections. It is not the practice in laying out public works to al allow to make allowances for the curvature of the earth. Mm. Number 13. In the 19th century, French experiment by M.M. 
Beol and Aragil, I'm probably saying those wrong, but a, a powerful lamp with good reflectors was placed on the summit of, oh boy, the, the Sierra de las Palmas in Spain and able to be seen all the way from Campri on the Isle of Aviza, the island of Aviza, since the elevation of the two points were identical and the distance between covered nearly 100 miles if the earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, the light should have been more than 6,600 feet, a mile and a quarter below the line of sight. Number 14, the Lieutenant Colonel Portlock experiment used oxyhydrogen, Drummond's lights, and heliostats to reflect the sun's rays across stations set up across 108 miles of St. George's Channel. If the Earth were actually a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, Portlock's, Portlock's light should have remained hidden under a mile and a half of curvature. Number 15, if the Earth were truly a sphere 25,000 miles in circumference, airplane pilots would have to constantly correct their altitudes downwards so as not to fly off straight off into outer space a pilot wishing to simply remain their, maintain their altitude at a typical cruising speed of 500 miles per hour would have to constantly dip their nose downwards and descend 2,777 feet, over half a mile, every minute. Otherwise, without compensation, in one hour's time, the pilot would find themselves 31.5 miles higher than expected. Number 16. The experiment, known as Aries failure, proved that the stars were relative to a stationary Earth and not the other way around. By first filling a telescope with water to slow down the speed of light inside, then calculating the tilt necessary to get the starlight directly down the tooth, Aries failed to prove the heliocentric theory since the star's light was already coming in the correct angle with no change necessary and instead proved the geocentric model correct. Number 17, Olber's paradox states that if there were billions of stars, which are suns, the night sky would be filled completely with light. As Edgar Allan Poe said, were the succession of stars endless, then the background of the sky would present us a uniform luminosity since there could exists absolutely no point in all that background at which would not exist a star. In fact, Olber's paradox is no more a paradox than the George Aries experiment was a failure. Both are actually excellent, excellent reputations of the heliocentric spinning ball model. Number 18, the Mickelson-Morley and San Sagnat experiments attempted to measure the change in speed of light due to Earth's assumed motion through space. After measuring in every possible different direction in various locations, they failed to detect any significant change whatsoever, again, proving the stationary geocentric model. Number 19. Tycho Brahe famously argued that the heliocentric theory in his time posited that if Earth, the Earth revolved around the sun, the change in relative position of the stars after six months orbital motion could not fail to be seen. He argued that the stars should seem to separate as we approach and come together as we recede. In actual fact, however, after 190 million miles of supposed orbit around the sun, not a single inch of parallax can be detected in the stars proving we have not moved at all. Number 20, if Earth were truly constantly spinning eastward at over 1,000 miles per hour, vertically fired cannonballs and other projectiles should fall significantly due west. In actual fact, however, whenever this has been tested, vertically fired cannonballs shoot upwards in an average of 14 seconds ascending 14 seconds descending and fall back to the ground normal, no more than two feet away from the cannon 
often directly back into the muzzle. 21. If the Earth were truly constantly spinning eastwards at over 1,000 miles per hour, and this 1,000 miles per hour is at the equator, helicopters and hot air balloons should be able to simply hover over the surface of the Earth and wait for their destination to come to them. Number 22. If Earth were truly constantly spinning eastwards at over 1,000 miles per hour during the Red Bull stratosphere dive, Felix Baumgartner, spending three hours ascending over New Mexico, should have landed 2,500 miles west into the Pacific Ocean, but instead landed a few dozen miles east of the takeoff point. Number 23, ball believers often claim gravity magically and inexplicably drags the entire lower atmosphere of the Earth in perfect synchronization up to some undetermined height where this progressively fast, faster spinning atmosphere gives way to the non-spinning, non-gravitized, non-atmosphere of infinite vacuum space. Such nonsensical theories are debunked, however, by rain, fireworks, birds, bugs, clouds, smoke, planes, and projectiles, all of which would behave differently if both the ball Earth and its atmosphere were constantly spinning eastwards at 1,000 miles per hour. Number 24. If Earth and its atmosphere were constantly spinning eastward over 1,000 miles per hour, then north-south facing cannons should establish a control, while east-firing cannonball should, cannonballs should fall significantly farther than all others, while west-firing cannonballs should fall significantly closer. In actual fact, re however, regardless of which direction cannons are fired, the distance covered is always the same. 25. If Earth and its atmosphere were constantly spinning eastwards over 1,000 miles per hour, then the average commercial airliner traveling 500 miles per hour should never be able to reach its eastward destinations before they come speeding up from behind. Likewise, westward de destinations should be arrived at thrice the speed, but this is not the case. Number 26, quoting Heaven and Earth by Gabrielle Henriette. If flying had been invented at the time of Copernicus, there is no doubt that he would soon have realized that his contention regarding the rotation of the Earth was wrong on account of the relation existing between the speed of an aircraft and that of the Earth's rotation. The Earth rotated rotates, as it is said, at 1,000 miles per hour, and a plane flies in the same direction at only 500 miles per hour, it is obvious that its place of destination will be farther removed every minute. On the other hand, if flying took place in the direction opposite to that of the rotation, a distance of 1,500 miles would be covered in one hour instead of 500, since the speed of the rotation is added to that of the plane. It could also be pointed out that such a flying speed of 1,000 miles per hour, which is supposed to, supposed to be that of the Earth's rotation, has recently been achieved so that an aircraft flying at this rate in the same direction as this rotation could not cover any ground at all. It would remain suspended in midair over the spot from which it took off since both speeds are equal. Twenty-seven. The only thing I would comment on this is there is such thing as there's already an amount of momentum when the aircraft takes off, but um, I'm not sure that a uh, aircraft would be able to even maintain the speed speed of the thousand miles an hour momentum for very long.
it would it would end up slowing down. That's my thought on that. Number 27, if, if Earth and its atmosphere were constantly spinning eastwards over 1,000 miles per hour, landing aircraft planes on such fast-moving runways, which face all manner of directions, north, south, east, and west, and otherwise would be practically impossible, yet in reality, such fictional concerns are completely negligible. 28, if the Earth and its atmosphere were constantly spinning eastward over 1,000 miles per hour, then clouds, wind, and weather patterns could not casually and unpredictably, unpredictably go every which way, with clouds often traveling in op opposing directions at varying altitudes simultaneously. If the Earth and its atmosphere were constantly spinning, this is number 29, if the Earth and the, its atmosphere were constantly spinning eastward, over 1,000 miles per hour, this should somehow, somewhere, be seen, heard, felt, or measured by someone. Yet no one in history has ever experienced this alleged eastward motion. Meanwhile, however, we can hear, feel, and experimentally measure even the slightest westward breeze. Number 30. In his book, South Sea Voyages, Arctic and Antarctic Explore, Explorer Sir James Clark Ross describes his experience on the night of November 27, 1839, and his conclusion that the Earth must be motionless. I quote, the sky being very clear, it enabled us to observe the higher stratum of clouds to be moving in an exact opposite direction to that of the wind, a circumstance which is frequently recorded in our meteorological journal, both in the northeast and southeast trades. And has also often been observed by former voyagers. Captain Basil Hall witnessed it from the summit of the peak of Tenerife and Count, oh my gosh, Stresh, Sturgeon, I don't know, Sturzelecki. <laughs> it's spelled S T R Z E L E C H I for those um, who can, can pronounce, I think it's Polish or Czech. I don't know. On ascending the volcanic mountain of Kirania in, oh my gosh, Owyhee, Owyhee, reached a 4,000 feet element above that of the trade wind and experienced the influence of an opposite current of air of a different hydro, hydrometric and thermometric condition. Count Zerlecki, further informed me of the following seemingly anomalous circumstance, that at the height of 6,000 feet, he found the current of air blowing at right angles to both the lower strata, also of a different hygrometric and thermometric condition, but warmer than the inner stratum. Such a state of the atmosphere is compatible only with the fact which other evidence has demonstrated that the Earth is at rest, unquote. Number 31, quoting Zetetic Cosmology, Thomas Winship states, quote, Let's ima let imagination picture to the mind what force air would have which was in set motion by a spherical body of 8,000 miles in diameter, which in one hour was spinning, 1, 000, was spinning around 1,000 miles per hour, rushing through space at 65,000 miles per hour and gyrating across the heavens. Then let conjecture endeavor to discover whether the inhabitants on such a globe could keep their hair on. If the Earth globe rotates on its axis at the terrific rate of 1,000 miles per hour, such an immense mass would of necess necessity cause a tremendous rush of wind in the space it occupied. The wind would all go one way, and anything like clouds which got within the sphere of influence of the rotating sphere would go the same way. The fact that the Earth is at rest is proved by kite flying, unquote. Number 32, if gravity is credited with being a force strong enough to hold the Earth's oceans, buildings, people, and atmosphere stuck to the surface of a rapidly spinning ball, that it is impossible for gravity to also simultaneously be weak enough to allow little birds, bugs, and planes to take off and travel freely, unabated in any direction.
33, if gravity, again, is credited, if I say gravity, I'm not going to keep doing this. Gravity is a theory that's unproven and it's false. But anyway, if gravity is credited with being a, oops, wait a minute, 33, I'm going to start this again. If gravity, this is number 33, is credited with being a force strong enough to curve the massive expanse of ocean around a globular earth, it would be impossible for fish and other creatures to th swim through such forcefully held water. Well, that's a good point. 34. Ship captains in navigating great distances at sea never need to factor the supposed curvature of the Earth into their calculations. Both plain sailing and great circle sailing the most popular navigation methods use plane, not spherical trigonometry, making all math <laughs> making all mathematical calculations on the assumption that the Earth is perfectly flat. If the Earth were in fact a sphere, such an such an errant assumption would lead to constant glaring inaccuracies. Plane sailing has worked perfectly fine, and I'm not talking airplanes; it's talking about if the flat plane as in the surface. Plane sailing has worked perfectly fine in both theory and practice for thousands of years, however, and plane trigonometry has time and again proven more accurate than spherical tri trigonometry in determining distances across the oceans. Thirty-five. If the all of the Earth were truly a globe, then every line of latitude south of the equator would have to measure a gradually smaller and smaller circumference the farther south traveled. If, however, the Earth is an extended plane, then every line of latitude south of the equator should measure a gradually larger and larger circumference the farther south traveled. The fact that many captains navigating south of the equator, assuming the globular theory, have found themselves drastically out of reckoning, more so the further south travel, testifies to the fact that the Earth is not of all. 36. During Captain James Clark Ross's voyages around the Antarctic circumference, he often wrote in his journal, perplexed at how they routinely found themselves out of accordance, accordance with their charts, stating that they found themselves an average of 12 to 16 miles outside their reckoning every day, later on further south as much as 29 miles. Number 37, Lieutenant Charles Wilk commanded a United States Navy exploration expedition to the Antarctic from 1838 to 1842, and his journals also mentions mentioned being consistently east of the, his reckoning, sometimes over 20 miles in less than 18 hours. 38. To quote Reverend Thomas Milner, quote, in the southern hemisphere, navigators to India have often fancied themselves east of the Cape when still west and have been driven ashore on the African coast, which, according to their reckoning, lay behind them. This more misfortune happened to a fine frigate, the Challenger, in 1845. How came Her Majesty's ship, Conqueror, to be lost? How have so many other noble vessels, perfectly sound, perfectly manned, perfectly navigated, been wrecked in calm weather, not only in dark night or in a fog, but in broad daylight and sunshine? in the former case upon the coast, in the latter upon sunken rocks, from being out of reckoning? The simple answer is the earth is not a ball. Number 39, practical distance measurements taken from the Australian Almanac Shippers and Importers Directory state that, that the straight line distance between Sydney and Nelson in 15, is 1,550 statute miles. Their given difference in longitude is 22 degrees, 2 feet, 2 minutes, and 14 seconds. Therefore, if two, 22 degrees, 2 minutes, and 14 seconds out of 360 is 1,550 miles, 
the entirety would measure 25,182 miles. This is not only larger than the ball Earth is said to be at the equator, but a whole 4,262 miles greater than it would be at these southern latitude on a globe of said proportions. From, uh, this is number 40, from near Cape Horn, Chile, to Port Phillip in Melbourne, Australia, the distance is 10,500 miles, or 143 degrees of lat longitude away. Factoring in the remaining degrees to 360 makes a total, makes for a total distance of 26,430 miles around this particular latitude, which is over 1,500 miles miles wider than the Earth is supposed to be at the equator and many more thousand miles, thousands of miles wider than it is supposed to be at such southern latitudes. Number 41. Some are similar, similar calculations made from the Cape of Good Hope, South Africa to Melbourne, Australia, at an average latitude of 35.5 degrees south have given an approximate figure of over 25,000 miles, which is again equal to or greater than the Earth's supposed greatest circumference at the equator. Calculations from Sydney, Australia to Wellington, New Zealand at an average of 37.5 degrees south have given an approximate circumference of 25,500 miles greater still. According to the ball Earth theory, the circumference of the Earth at 37.5 degrees southern latitude should only be 19,757 statute miles, almost 6,000 miles less than such practical measurements. Number 42. In the ball Earth model, Antarctica is an ice continent which covers the bottom of the ball from 78 degrees south latitude to 90 and is therefore not more than 12,000 miles in circumference. Many early explorers, including Captain Cook and James Clark Ross, however, in attempting Antarctic circumnavigation took three to four years and clocked 50 to 60,000 60, miles around. The British ship Challenger also made an indirect but complete circumnavigation of Antarctica, traversing 69,000 miles. This is entirely inconsistent with the ball model. Number 43. If the Earth were a ball, there are several flights in the southern hemisphere which would have their quickest, straightest path over the Antarctic continent, such as Santiago, Chile to Sydney, Australia. Instead of taking the shortest, quickest route in a straight line over Antarctica, all such flights deter all manner of directions away from Antarctica instead of claiming instead of claiming the temperatures too cold for airplane travel. Considering the fact that there are plenty of flights to, from, and over Antarctica, and NASA claims to have technology keeping them in conditions far colder and far harder, far hotter than any experience on Earth, such an excuse is clearly just an excuse. And these flights aren't made because they are impossible. Number 44. If Earth was a ball, Antarctica was, if Ant, and Antarctica was too cold to fly over, the only logical way to fly from Sydney to Santiago would be a straight shot over the Pacific, staying in the southern hemisphere the entire way. Refueling could be done in New Zealand or other southern hemisphere destinations along the way if absolutely necessary. In actual fact, however, Santiago Sydney flights go into the Northern Hemisphere, making stopovers at LAX and other North American airports before continuing back down to the Southern Hemisphere. Such ridiculously wayward detours make no sense on the globe, but make perfect sense and form nearly straight lines when shown on a flat Earth map. Number 45. On a ball Earth, Johannesburg, South Africa to Perth, Australia, should be a straight shot over the Indian Ocean with convenient refueling possibilities on Mauritius, Mar Mauritius, or Madagascar. In actual practice, however, 
most Johannesburg to Perth flights continuously stop over either in Dubai, Hong Kong, or Malaysia, all of which make no sense on the ball, but are completely understandable when mapped on a flat earth. <clears throat> Number 46. On a ball earth Cape Town, South Africa, to Buenos Aires, Argentina, should be a straight shot over the Atlantic, following the same line of latitude across. But instead, every flight goes to connecting locations in the Northern Hemisphere. First, stopping over anywhere from London to Turkey to Dubai. Once again, these make absolutely no sense on the globe, but are completely understandable options when mapped on a flat Earth. 47. On a ball Earth, Johannesburg, South Africa to Sao Paulo, Brazil, should be a quick straight line, straight shot along the 25th Southern Latitude. But instead, nearly every flight makes a refueling stop at the 50th degree North Latitude in London first. The only reason such a ridiculous stopover works in reality is because the Earth is flat. 48. On a ball Earth, Santiago, Chile to Johannesburg, South Africa, should be an easy flight all taking place below the Tropic of Capricorn in the Southern Hemisphere. Yet every listed flight makes a curious refueling stop in Senegal near the Tropic of Cancer in the Northern Hemisphere first. When mapped on a flat Earth, the reason why is clear to see. However, Senegal is actually directly in a straight line path halfway between the two. Number 49. I think I'm only going to do 100 tonight, and I'll save the other 100 for next week. I'm going to use up too much time. If Earth were a spinning ball heated by a sun 93 million miles away, it would be impossible to have simultaneously sweltering summers in Africa while just a few thousand miles away, bone-chilling, frozen Arctic, Antarctic winters experiencing little to no heat from the sun whatsoever. If the heat from the sun traveled 93 million miles to the Sahara Desert, it is absolutely, it is absurd to assert that another 4,000 miles, which would be 0.00004% further to Antarctica would completely negate such sweltering heat resulting in such drastic differences. 50, if the earth were truly a globe, the Antarctic and the Arctic polar regions and areas of comparable latitude north and south of the equator should share, should, should share similar conditions and characteristics such as comparable temperatures, seasonal changes, length of daylight, plant and animal life. In reality, however, the, the Arctic, Antarctic regions and areas of comparable latitude north and south of the equator differ greatly in many ways entirely consistent, inconsistent with the ball model and entirely consistent with the flat model. Number 51, Antarctica is by far the coldest pla place on Earth with an average annual temperature of approximately minus 57 degrees Fahrenheit and a record low of minus 138.8 degrees Fahrenheit. The average annual temperature of the North at the North Pole, however, is a, com is a comparable comparatively warm four degrees. Throughout the year, temperatures in the Antarctic vary less than half the amount at comparable Arctic latitudes. The Northern Arctic region enjoys moderately warm summers and manageable winters, whereas the Southern Antarctic region never even warms enough to melt the perpetual snow and ice. On a tilting, wobbling, ball earth spinning uniformly around the sun, Arctic and Antarctic temperatures and seasons should not vary so greatly. 52. Iceland at 65 degrees. I'm going to fix this. Hold on. I can fix this. Okay, 52. Iceland at 65 degrees north latitude is home to 870 species of native plants and abundant various animal life. Compare this with the Isle of Georgia at just 54 degrees south latitude, 
where there are only 18 species of native plants and animal life is almost non-existent. The same latitude as Canada or England in the north where dense forests of various tall trees abound, the infamous Captain Cook wrote of Georgia that he was unable to find a single shrub large enough to make a toothpick. Cook wrote, not a tree was to be seen. The lands which lie to the south are doomed by nature to perpetual frigidness, never to feel the warmth of the sun's rays, whose horrible and savage aspect I have not words to describe. Even marine life is sparse in certain tracts of vast extent, and the sea bird is seldom observed flying over such lonely wastes. A contrast between the limits of organic life in Arctic and Antarctic zones is very remarkable and significant. Number 53. At places of comparable latitude, north and south, the sun behaves very differently than it would on a spinning ball earth. Okay, I got to start over here. At places of comparable latitude, north and south, the sun behaves very differently than it would on a spinning ball earth, but precisely how it should on a flat earth. For example, the longest summer days of north of the equator are much longer than those south of the equator, and the shortest winter days north of the equator are much shorter than the shortest south of the equator. This is inexplicable on a uniformly spinning, wobbling ball earth, but fits exactly on the flat model, the sun traveling circles over and around the earth from tropic to tropic. 54. At places of comparable latitude, north and south, dawn and dusk happens very differently than they would on a spinning ball, but precisely how they would on a flat earth. In the north, dawn and dusk come slowly and last far longer than in the south, where they come and go very quickly. Certain places in the north, twilight can last for over an hour, while at comparable southern latitudes, within a few minutes, the sunlight completely disappears. This is inexpli inexplicable on a uniformly spinning, wobbling ball earth, but is exactly what is expected on a flat earth, with the sun traveling faster, wider circles over the south and slower, narrower circles over the north. 55. If the sun circles over and around the earth every 24 hours, steadily traveling from tropic to tropic every six months, it follows that the northern central region would annually receive far more heat and sunlight than the southern circumferential region. Since the sun must sweep over the larger southern region in the same 24 hours that has to pass over the smaller northern region, its passage must necessarily be proportionately faster as well. This perfectly explains the difference in Arctic and Antarctic temperatures, seasons, length of daylight, plant and animal life. This is why the Antarctic morning dawn and evening twilight are very abrupt compared with the north, and this explains why many Midsummer Arctic nights, the sun does not set at all. 56. The midnight sun is an Arctic phenomenon occurring annually during the summer solstice where, the, where for several days straight, an observer, an observer, and it, okay, let me start over. The midnight sun is an Arctic phenomenon occurring annually during the summer solstice where for several days straight an observer significantly far enough north can watch the sun travel circles overhead rising and falling in the sky throughout the day but never fully setting for up of 72 plus hours if the earth were actually a spinning globe revolving around the sun the only place such a phenomenon such as the midnight sun could be observed would be at the poles any other vantage point from 89 degrees latitude downwards, could never, regardless any tilt or inclination, see the sun for 24 hours straight. So they see the sun or an entire revolution on a spinning globe at a point other than the poles would have, you would have to be looking through miles and miles of land and sea for part of the revolution. Oh, brother, here we go again. I gotta fix this, another one.
57, the establishment claims the midnight sun is experienced in Antarctica, but they conveniently do not have any uncut video showing this, nor do they allow independent explorers, explorers to travel to Antarctica during the winter solstice to verify or refute these claims. Conversely, there are dozens of uncut videos publicly available showing the Arctic midnight sun, and it has been verified beyond any shadow of a doubt. Fifty-eight, the Royal Belgian Geographical Society in their expedition Antarctic Belge recorded that during the most severe part of the Antarctic winter, from seventy-one degrees south latitude onwards, the sun may the sun sets on May seventeenth. It is not seen above the horizon again until July twenty-first. This is completely at odds with the Baller theory but easily explained by the flat earth model. The midnight sun is seen from high altitude in extreme northern latitudes during Arctic summer because the sun at its innermost cycle is circling tightly enough around the polar center that it remains visible above the horizon for someone at such a vantage point. Likewise, in extreme southern latitudes during Arctic summer, the sun completely dis disappears from view for over two months because they're at the lower there at the lower tropic, northern tropic, at the innermost of its boomerang journey, the sun is circling the northern center too tightly to be seen from the southern circumference. Ooh, maybe I shouldn't have done this many. My mouth is being tw twisted. Number 59. Quoting Gabrielle Henriette. The theory of the rotation of the Earth may once and for all be definitely disposed of as impractical by pointing out the, the following in, inadvertence. It is said that the rotation takes 24 hours and that its speed is uniform, in which case necessarily days and nights should have an identical duration of 12 hours each all the year round. The sun should invariably raise, rise in the morning and set in the evening at the same hours with the result that it would be the equinox every day from the 1st of January to the 31st of December. One should stop and reflect on this before saying that the Earth has a movement of rotation. How does the system of gravitation account for the seasonal variations in the length of days and nights if the Earth rotates at a uniformly uniform speed in 24 hours? Number 60. Anyone can prove the sea horizon perfectly straight and the entire Earth perfectly still, using nothing more than a level, tripods, and a wooden plank. At any altitude above sea level, simply fix a 6 foot to 12 foot long, smooth, level board edgewise upon tripods and observe the skyline from eye level behind it. The distant horizon will always align perfectly parallel to the upper edge of the board. Furthermore, if you move in a half circle from one end of the board to the other whilst observing the skyline over the upper edge, you will not be able to trace, you will be able to trace a clear flag 10 to 20 miles depending on your altitude. This would be impossible if the Earth were a globe 25,000 miles in circumference. The horizon would align over the center of the board, but then gradually noticeably decline towards the extremities. Just 10 miles on each side would necessitate an easily visible curvature of 66.6 feet from each end to the center. Sixty-one. If the Earth were actually a big ball, 25,000 miles in circumference at the equator, the horizon would be noticeably curved even at sea level and everything on and everything on or approaching horizon would appear to tilt backwards slightly from your perspective distant buildings along the horizon would all look like leaning towers of pisa falling away from the observer a hot air balloon taking off then drifting steadily away from you on a ball earth would slowly and constantly appear to lean back more and far more and more the farther away it flew. 
the bottom of the basket coming gradually into view as the top of the balloon disappears from your sight. In reality, however, buildings, balloons, trees, people, anything and everything at right angles to the ground horizon remains so regardless the distance or height of remains so regardless the distance or height of the observer. 62. Samuel Robotham's experiments at the old Bedford level proved conclusively that the canal's water to be completely flat over a six-mile stretch. First, he stood in the canal with, its, with his telescope held eight inches above the surface of the water. Then his friend in a boat with a five-foot tall flag sailed the six miles away. If the Earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference at the equator... I got to pause for a second. I gotta... All right. I'm going to have to reread that one because I had to pause and go rescue my wife. Her, uh, her recliner come unplugged. She couldn't get out of it. Anyway, so 62. Samuel Robotham's experiments at the Old Bedford level proved conclusively the canal's water to be completely flat over a six-mile stretch. First, he stood in the canal with his telescope held eight, eight inches above the surface of the water. Then his friend in a boat with a five-foot tall flag sailed the six miles away. If the Earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference at the equator, the six-mile stretch of water should have comprised of an arc exactly six feet high in the middle, so the entire boat and flag should have ultimately disappeared when, in fact, the entire bow and flag remained visible at the same height for the entire journey. 63. In a second experiment, Dr. Robotham affixed flags five feet high along the shoreline, one at every mile marker. Then, using his telescope mounted at five feet just behind the first flag, looked over the top of all six, the tops of all six flags, which lined up in a perfectly straight line. If the earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference at the equator, the flags should have progressively dipped down after the first establishing line of sight. The second would have set at eight inches, 32 inches for the third, six feet for the fourth, 10 feet, eight inches for the fifth, and 16 feet, eight inches for the sixth. Sixty-four. Quoting Earth Not a Globe by Samuel Samuel Robotham, quote, it is known that the horizon at sea, whatever distance it may extend to the right and left of the observer on land, always appears as a straight line. The following experiment has been tried in various parts of the country at Brighton on a rising ground near the race course, two poles were fixed in the earth six yards apart and directly opposite the sea. Between these poles, a line was tied, was tightly stretched parallel to the horizon. From the center of the line, the view embraced not less than 20 miles on each side, making a distance of 40 miles. A vessel was observed sailing directly westwards, the line cutting the rigging a little above the bulwarks, which it did for several hours or until the vessel had sailed the whole distance of 40 miles. The ship coming into view from the east would have to ascend an inclined plane for 20 miles until it arrived at the center of the earth, whence it would have to descend for the same distance. The square of 20 miles multiplied by eight inches gives 266 feet as the amount the vessel would have would be below the line at the beginning and end of the 40 miles. 65, also quoting Dr. Robotham. On the shore near Waterloo, a few miles to the north of Liverpool, a good telescope was fixed at an elevation of six feet above the water. It was directed to a large steamer just leaving the River Mercy, sailing out to Dublin. 
Gradually, the masthead of the receding vessel came nearer to the horizon until at length, after more than four hours had elapsed, it disappeared. The ordinary rate of sailing of the Dublin sea, um, steamers was fully eight miles an hour, so that the vessel would be at least 32 miles distant when the masthead came to the horizon. The six feet of elevation of the telescope would require three miles to be deducted for con convexity, which would leave 29 miles, the square of which multiply eight inches gives 560 feet, deducting 80 feet for the height of the main mass. And we find that according to the doctrine of rotundity, the masthead of the outward bound steamer should have been 450, 480 feet below the horizon. Many other experiments of this kind have been made upon seagoing steamers and always with results incompatible with the theory that the Earth is a globe. 66. Dr. Robotham conducted several other experiments using telescopes, spirit levels, sextants, and theodolites, special precision instruments for measuring angles in horizontal or vertical planes. By positioning by Positioning them at equal heights aimed at each other, successively he proved successively he proved over and over the earth to be perfectly flat for miles without a single inch of curvature. His findings caused quite a stir in the scientific community, and thanks to 30 years of his efforts, the shape of the earth became a hot topic of debate around the turn of the 19th century. Number 67. Distance across the Irish Sea from the Isle of Man's Douglas Harbor to Great Arms Head in North Wales is 60 miles. If the Earth was a globe, then the surface of the water between them would form a 60-mile arc, the center towering 1,944 feet higher than the coastlines at either end. It is well known and easily verifiable. However, that on a clear day, from a modest altitude of 100 feet, the Great Orm's Head is visible from Douglas Harbor. This would be completely impossible on a globe of 22,000 miles circumference. Assuming the 100-foot altitude causes the horizon to appear approximately 13 miles off, the, the 47 miles remaining means the Welsh Cobb coastline should still fall an impossible 1,472 feet below the line of sight. 68. The Philadelphia skyline is clearly visible from Apple Pie Hill in the New Jersey Pine Barrens, 40 miles away. If Earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, factoring in the 205 foot elevation of Apple Pie Hill, the Philly skyline should remain well hidden beyond 335 feet of curvature. 69. The New York City skyline is clearly visible from Harriman State Park's Bear Mountain, 60 miles away. Again, if Earth were a ball, 25,000 miles in circumference, viewing from Bear Mountain's 1,283-foot summit, the Pythagor <laughs> the, Pythag the Pythagorean theorem determining distance to the horizon being 1.23 times the square root of the height in feet, the New York City skyline should be invisible behind 170 feet of curved earth. Ooh. 70. From Washington's Rock in New Jersey, at just a 400-foot elevation, it is possible on a clear day to see the skylines of both New York and Philadelphia in opposite directions at the same time covering a total distance of 120 miles. If Earth were a ball, 25,000 miles in circumference, both of these skylines should be hidden behind over 800 feet of Earth's curvature. 71. It is often possible to see the Chicago skyline from sea level 60 miles away across Lake Michigan. In 2015, after photographer Joshua Nowicki photographed this phenomenon, several news channels quickly claimed his picture to be a su superior mirage, an atmospheric anomaly caused by temperature inversion. While these certainly do occur, occur the skyline in question was facing right side up and clearly seen, unlike a hazy illusory image 
Mirage and on a ball earth 25,000 miles in circumference. Oh my gosh, circumference should be 2,400 feet below the horizon. Number 72, October 16, 1854. The Times newspaper record, reported the Queen's visit to Great Grimsby from Hull, recording they were able to see the 300 foot tall dock tower from 70 miles away. On a ball, 25,000 miles in circumference, factoring their 10 foot elevation above the water and the tower's 300 foot height. At 70 miles away, the dock sh tower should have remained an entire 2,600 feet below the horizon. 73. In, hold on, let me move this. In 1872, Captain Gibson and crewmates sailing the ship Thomas Wood from China to London reported seeing the entirety of St. Helena Island on a clear day from 75 miles away. Factoring in their height during measurement on a ball earth 25,000 miles in circumference, it was found the island should have been 3,650 feet below their line of sight. 74, from Genoa, Italy, at a height of just 70 feet above sea level, the island of Gorgona can often be seen 81 miles away. If earth, where a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, Gorgona should be hidden beyond 3,332 feet of curvature. 75. From Genoa, Italy, at a height of just 70 feet above sea level, the island of Corsica can often be seen 99 miles away. If Earth was a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, Corsica should fall 5,245 feet almost an entire mile below the horizon. From Genoa, Italy, 70 feet above sea level, the island of Caprea, 102 miles away, can often be seen as well. If Earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, Caprea should always remain hidden behind 5,605 feet, over a mile of supposed curvature. Also from Genoa, on, a bright, on bright clear days, the island of Elba can be seen an incredible 125 miles away. If Earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, Elba should be forever invisible behind 8,770 feet of curvature. 78. From Anchorage, Alaska, at an elevation of 102 feet on clear days, Mount Four Acre can be seen with the naked eye 120 miles away. If worth were a ball, 25,000 miles in circumference, Mount Four Acres, 17,400 foot summit, should be leaning back away from the, the observer, covered by 7,719 feet of curved earth. In reality, however, the entire mountain can be quite easily seen standing straight from base to summit. 79. From Anchorage, Alaska, at an elevation of 102 feet on clear days, Mount McKinley can be seen with the naked eye from 130 miles away. If Earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, Mount McKinley's 20,000 320 foot summit should be leaning back away from the observer and almost half covered by 9,220 feet of curved earth. In reality, however, the entire mountain can be quite easily seen standing straight from base to summit. Number 80. In Chambers Journal, February 1895, a sailor named a sailor near Mora. Oh, I don't know how to say it. Mar Mauritius in the Indian Ocean reported having seen a vessel which turned out to be an incredible 200 miles away. The incident caused much heated debate in nautical circles at the time, 
gaining further confirmation in Aden, Yemen, where another witness reported seeing a missing Bombay streamer from 200 miles away. He correctly stated the precise appearance, location, and direction of the steamer, all later corroborated and confirmed correct by those on board. Such sightings are absolutely inexplicable if the Earth were actually a ball 25,000 miles around, as ships 200 miles distant would fall, would have to fall approximately five miles below line of sight. 81. The distance from which various lighthouse lights around the world are visible at sea far exceeds what could be found on a ball earth 25,000 miles around in circumference. For example, the Dunkirk light in southern France at an altitude of 194 feet is visible from a boat 10 feet above sea level 28 miles away. Sir, spherical trigonometry dictates that if the Earth was a globe with the given curvature of 8 inches per mile squared, this light should be hidden 190 feet below the horizon. 82. The Port Nicholson light in New Zealand is 420 feet above sea level and visible from 35 miles away, where it should be 220 feet below the horizon. 83. The Aguero light in Norway is 154 feet above high water and visible for 28 statute miles, where it should be 230 feet below the horizon. 84. The light at Madras on the Esplanade is 132 feet high and visible from 28 miles away, where it should be 250 feet below the line of sight. 85. The Cordon, the, the Cordonin light on the west coast of France is 270 feet high and visible from 31 miles away, where it should be 280 feet below the line of sight. 86. The light at Camp at Cape Bonavista, Newfoundland, is 150 feet above sea level and visible at 35 miles, where it should be 491 feet below the horizon. 87. The, uh, the lighthouse steeple of St. Batalt's Parish in Boston is 290 feet tall and visible from over 40 miles away, where it should be hidden a full 800 feet below the horizon. 88. The Isle of Wight lighthouse in England is 180 feet high and can be seen up to 42 miles away, a distance at which modern astronomers say the light should fall 996 feet feet below line of sight. 89. The Cape the, the Cape La Golhas lighthouse in South Africa is 33 feet high, 238 feet above sea level, and can be seen for over 50 miles. If the world were a globe, this light would fall 1,400 feet below an observer's line of sight. 90. The Statue of Liberty in New York stands 326 feet above sea level and on a clear day can be seen from as far away as 60 miles. If the Earth were a globe, that would put Lady Liberty at an impossible 2,074 feet below the horizon. 91. The lighthouse at Port Sayed, Egypt, at an elevation of only 60 feet, has been seen an astonishing 80 or 58 miles away, where, according to modern astronomy, it should be 2,182 feet below the line of sight. 92. The Notre Dame Antwerp Spire stands 430, 403 feet high from the foot of the tower with Strasbourg measuring 468 feet above sea level. With the aid of a telescope, ships can be distinguished on the horizon, and captains declare they can see the cathedral spire from a, an amazing 150 miles away. If the Earth were a globe, however, at that distance, the spire, the spire would be an entire mile, 5,280 feet below the horizon. Number 93. The St. George's Channel between Holyhead and Kingstown Harbor near Dublin is 60 miles across. When halfway across, a ferry passenger will notice them 
behind them, the light on Holyhead Pier, as well as in front of them, the pool bag light in Dublin Bay. The Holyhead Pier light is 44 feet high, while the pool bag lighthouse 68 feet. Therefore, a vessel in the middle of the channel, 30 miles from either side, standing on a deck 24 feet above the water, can clearly see both lights. On a ball earth, 25,000 miles in circumference. However, both lights should be hidden well below the horizons by over 300 feet. 94. I'm getting close to my 100. From the highland near Portsmouth Harbor in Hampshire, England, looking across Spithead, the island of White, the entire base of the island where water and land can come together compose a perfectly straight line 22 miles long. According to the Baller theory, the Isle of Wight should decline 80 feet from the center on each side to account for the necessary curvature. The crosshairs of a good theodolite, theodolite directed there, however, have repeatedly shown that the land and water line to be perfectly level. 95. Let me again. On a clear day from the highland near Douglas Harbor on the Isle of Man, the whole length of the coast of North Wales is often visibly, plainly visible to the naked eye. From the point of air at the mouth of the River Dee to Holyhead comprises a 50 mile stretch, which has also been repeatedly found to be perfectly horizontal. If the Earth actually had curvature of eight inches per mile squared, as NASA and modern astronomy claim, the 50 mile length of Welsh coast seen along the horizon in Liverpool Bay would have to decline from the center point and easily detectable 416 feet on each side. Number 96. From 100 proofs the Earth is not a globe by William Carpenter, if we take a journey down the Chesapeake Bay by night, we shall see the light exhibited at Sharps Island for an hour before the steamer gets to it. We may take up a position on the deck so that the rail of the vessel's side will be in a line with the light and in the line of sight, and we shall find that in the whole journey, the light won't vary in the slightest degree in its apparent elevation. But say that a distance of 13 miles has been traversed, the astronomer's theory of curvature demands a difference one way or the other in the apparent ele elevation of the light of 112 feet 8 inches. Since, however, there is not a difference of 100 hairs breadth, we have a plain proof that the water of the Chesapeake Bay is not curved, which is a proof that the Earth is not a globe. 97. NASA and modern astronomy say the Earth is a giant ball tilted back, wobbling and spinning, 1,000 miles per hour around its central axis, traveling 67,000 miles per hour around the sun, spiraling 500,000 miles per hour around the Milky Way, while the entire galaxy rockets a ridiculous 670 million miles per hour through the universe, with all of these motions originating from an alleged Big Bang cosmogenic explosion 14 billion years ago. That's a grand total of 670, 568, 670 million, 568,000 miles per hour in several different directions were all supposedly speeding along as simultaneously, yet no one has ever seen, felt, heard, measured, or proven a single one of these motions to exist whatsoever. 98. NASA and modern astronomy say Polaris, the North Pole star, is somewhere between 323 to 434 light years away, or about two quadrillion miles from us. Firstly, note, firstly, note, that is between <laughs> 101 quadrillion 920 938 trillion miles 
a two quadrillion six hundred and four trillion miles, making a difference of six hundred and sixty six trillion miles. Notice that there's a lot of six six sixes in all this. If modern astronomy cannot even agree on the distance to stars within trillion, hundreds of trillions of miles, perhaps their science is flawed and the theory needs re-examining. However, even granting them their obscurely distant stars, it is impossible for heliocentrists to explain how Polaris manages to always remain perfectly aligned straight above the North Pole throughout the Earth's various alleged tilting, wobbling, rotating, and revolving motions. 99. Viewed from a ball Earth, Polaris, situated directly over the North Pole, should not be visible anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere. For Polaris to be seen from the Southern Hemisphere of a globular Earth, the observer would have to somehow, have to be somehow looking through the globe and miles of land and sea would have to be transparent. Polaris can be seen, however, up, however, up to over 20 degrees south latitude. 100. If Earth were a ball, the Southern Cross and other Southern constellations would all be visible at the same time from every longitude on the same latitude as is the case in the North Pole with Polaris and its surrounding constellations. Ursa Major and Ursa Minor and many others can be seen from every northern meridian simultaneously, whereas in the south, constellations like the Southern Cross cannot. This proves the southern hemisphere is not turned under as in the ball earth model, but simply stretching further outwards away from the northern center point as in the flat earth model. So I'm going to conclude at number 100 tonight. Um, all of these facts can be researched and found to be true. Don't take my word for it or the author of all this. Do your own research, but it's pretty compelling reasons right there that the, we do not live on a spinning, wobbling, orbiting, flying through space, ball of rock that somehow holds on to all its water while it's spinning. Yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. Investigate Flat Earth. Please do. This could be the greatest revelation and the greatest um, source of um, revival as the... Uh, the flat earth model can only happen because the creator created it. Big Bang, um, all other theories like that, evolution will be thrown out the window. But of course, science can't allow that. So that's why they keep promoting their false narratives. But anyways, research flat earth. Subscribe to this channel. Um, look up the flat earth podcast or flat earth Dave. He has some awesome videos. He has an app called the, I don't know, I got to look it up because I can never remember. Hold on. The Sun, Moon, hold on, let me, hold on. Okay, it's the, let's see. Sun, Moon, Flat Earth, Sun, Moon, just look it up, Flat Earth, um, just look up Flat Earth Dave. He's got it on his, on his website. I can't think of the name of it right at the moment. But have a good night and God bless.